now they're not just seeing every movement that you make, they're also inside your head. This is how people are. They get, and they get, just get more and more paranoid. Well, it's now called a useful fiction, right? Because my point here was that things don't need to be true to help people. You can have useful fictions that help people, that save their lives. I'm sure someone will note my obvious disadvantage in this debate, and that being my association with the Satanic Temple, a religion that actually does more good than harm. So to avoid any accusation of hypocrisy, I must point out a couple things there. One, I paid $25 for a membership to the Satanic Temple where I hold no position or title, and having membership technically does make me a Satanist, but I paid for an ordination with the Universal Life Church, and I simultaneously have another ordination with the Church of the Subgenius, also known as the Church of Bob. And I have a third ordination with the Church of the Latter-day Dude which makes me a Dudist priest, man. Satanism doesn't have any beliefs apart from an agreement with the seven tenets, which only amount to a very short list of social ethics, not any declaration of faith. As a matter of fact, one of the seven tenets specifically condemns faith, saying that beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world and that one should never or take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's beliefs. In that sense, Satanism is basically humanism in goth drag. Uh, Satanism is recognized as a religion by the United States government only because a Supreme Court justice once expressed the not legally binding opinion that he thinks ethical culture should qualify as a religion and he thinks that includes humanism. If so, then that would logically have to include Satanism too. I have a different opinion. I think it's hilarious when believers in traditional religions try to project their own faults onto me by falsely accusing me of scientism. Or they say that the rejection of religion is a religion, and that evolutionism <coughs> is a religion, but those same people say that Satanism is not a religion because they don't have a consistent definition of what a religion is, and the U.S. government doesn't either, but I do. As I understand it, Every concept that is commonly accepted as a religion by both its adherents and its critics is a doctrine of ritual traditions, ceremonies, mythology, and the associated dogma of faith-based belief systems which all posit the notion that a supernatural essence of self, be it a soul or consciousness, memories, etc., may in some way transcend the death of the physical body to continue on in some other form. That is the definition I will adhere to in this debate. It applies to every traditional religion and only to religion, but not to any of the positions I hold nor to any of the organizations to which I belong. Because Pastafarians don't really believe in the flying spaghetti monster, just like the sub genii don't really believe in the slack master J.R. Bob Dobbs, and no one really believes in the invisible pink unicorn, and Satanists don't believe in Satan, like Christians and Muslims do. Otherwise, Satanism might be the only religion that does more good than harm, but they cannot compete with the long and bloody history of racism, nationalism, sexism, holy wars, interdenominational inter conflict, stoic opposition to progress of any kind, but especially on social issues, and the oppression of, dis of dissension that have, we've seen rampant in Christianity, Islam, in Hinduism, Judaism, and most other religions as well. Groups who tend to treat heresy, blasphemy, and apostasy as capital crimes and in denial of one of our most fundamental rights, the right to free thought, the right to think and believe whatever we do for whatever reason makes sense to us. Religion would deny us even that. I find it amusing that T-Jump wants to debate whether religion does more harm than good. The question allows that we both understand a, a long list of horrors. We both understand the long list of horrors that have historically been and currently still are being done in the name of every faith. And we can both accept that maybe there's some placebo effect in believing allegedly harmless white lies for whatever that's worth. Nor do I feel the need to bring everybody down by listing myriad atrocities done in the name of some religion or another popping up in the news of any given week. And I honestly think we've heard enough of that and we don't need to hear about it anymore. And wouldn't that be nice? We didn't have to hear about any of the persistent evils of religious faith anymore. But it never ends. And I'll admit that modern religion has had to adopt some kind of public relations. It's not like it used to be, where they used to be the ultimate authority and were totally criminally corrupt. And consequently, some churches really do donate to charities sometimes. Although in Dallas, where I live, we have scammers like Kenneth Copeland, and we had Reverend Bobby Tilton, who took in tens of millions of dollars for an orphanage in Haiti 
until it was discovered that that orphanage never existed. Catholics really do have orphanages around the world and only sometimes do they rape little boys and very rarely do they murder all their indigenous students and bury them in secret. And some religions like Jehovah's Witnesses only offer charity to their own and Mormons only help those who are on the rolls for paying tithe. My mother is one of those who typically pays 10% of her gross and the more desperate her situation becomes, the more she pays because she thinks she's buying blessings when really all she's doing is keeping herself accursed. The LDS helped her out with a few bags of groceries every so often and I appreciate that, although what they gave her in groceries during the hard times were less than what she usually paid in tithing. That and the Church of Latter-day Saints is one of the smaller and newer religions, yet they are also reportedly already the richest religion on the planet, richer even than the long-established and global Catholic Church. So how the LDS manage their charity is clearly not doing as well or doing as much good as they could or should. And isn't it sad when believers will pay more than they can afford in order to be healed by some fraud who never had that ability or worse, when the mentally ill are abused by some idiot who actually thinks he's exercising demons. The question isn't whether any religious person has done more harm than good, nor whether most religious people have caused more harm than good. It's whether religion as a whole is doing more harm than good. And whenever I argue religion with believers, I have to ask what is the advantage or benefit of being completely convinced of things that are not evidently nor even possibly true? because there's never been any support for anything supernatural and no support for mind-body dualism, neither in neuroscience nor even in philosophy, but all religions depend on that. Even Christian scientists admit that the story of Adam and Eve is genetically impossible and is only mythology adopted from elder uh, neighboring polytheism. Anthropologists know that the Tower of Babel never happened, archeologists know that the Exodus never happened and that Moses never existed. And many different fields of science can all prove that the global flood never happened. All religion is a denial of reality to some degree, to believe in things that are not supported by anything. The difference between moderate faith and religious extremism is just how much of reality is being denied or ignored. Whenever this comes up, believers ask me what harm there is in believing things that are not true and repeating baseless assertions as if they are true. The question always comes down to what's wrong with lying? And the first thing wrong with that is that somebody might believe it. Belief informs actions and misinformation is misleading, often to horrific ends. Lest we forget that the Bible and the Quran and Hindu scriptures too include commands that unbelievers should be killed, even if they're close family and friends. And we know that earlier pagan religions did the same. Each of these religions also endorsed the suppression of women and encouraged behaviors that are irrational, illogical, and objectively immoral and that people should pursue these awful behaviors with un unreasonable conviction and righteous zeal. For example, later today, we're going to have a debate over child marriage because the Bible and the Quran both support that. I have also seen a number of studies <coughs> showing that mere intrinsic religiosity still has mentally debilitating effects. There is a detriment to your ability to reason if you've been conditioned by the threat of a fate worse than death that you have to make believe impossible absurdities even when all the evidence says otherwise. One study shows that uh, non-religious children are more capable of distinguishing facts from fiction than religious children who are more susceptible to deceptive fantasy. Another study show from the Journal of Religion shows that students' performance on reading, math, and science tests were all recognizably hampered by several forms of parental religiosity, even when it is merely intrinsic. Another study shows that nothing fails like prayer, not only do prayers not make anything better, they actually make things worse, even in health-related situations, such that prayer fails even in the instance where it should have had a placebo effect. Yet another study shows that religious people mistake mental health to be a spiritual problem and will seek spiritual guidance from clergy who don't know any better, rather than seek psychi psychiatric help, which they've been conditioned to distrust. And one more study, funded by the Global Center for Religious Research, found that a third of Americans have experienced religious trauma. Some of the symptoms are nightmares, shame, depression, fear, stress, and anxiety. 90% of us know someone like this. So does any institution that has traumatized at least a third of the US count as mostly bad or good? Look at it this way, if a medication left 30% of the recipients mentally ill, 
Would it be seen as mostly good medication? Now extrapolate that back to traumatizing 30% of America. And also, that is leaving out the percentage of people who are causing religious trauma with physical and mental abuse, which I'm sure we'll talk about shortly. All for a belief in an indefensible absurdity with no truth in it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for that opening, Aaron. We'll switch it over to Tom for his opening as well. Thanks for being with us, Tom. The floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Arn. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you to the audience for coming. Really appreciate the support. We need you guys to be able to keep these things going. So thank you. Like and comment and subscribe to me and James, but mostly me. Um, top of the day is, does religion cause more harm than good? Uh, the harm caused by religion, there is a lot of it. I agree with the vast majority of what, what Arn said. Uh, religion has caused 7% of wars and 11% of the deadliest atrocities according to the Encyclopedia of Wars. These wars would not have happened if there was no religion. Religion does cause bigotry. It does hold back scientific progress. For example, in the Islam of the 1200s famously outlawed math and trade, which set them back thousands of years. Newton famously argued that the orbits of the planets could only be explained by a god, famously debunked by Laplace. It holds back moral progress, women's rights, Indian slavery, workers' rights, animals' rights, racism, guilt, manipulation of children, ethnocentrism, homophobia, militarism, all the things are listed. It does do that for some people. So does religion increase violence and bigoted behavior in some people? Yes, but the question isn't does it increase it in some people, the question is does it increase it overall? The question is, does it also decrease violent behavior in people as well? And does it do that more than it does the increase? So the good cause by religion, there is also a lot of it. Uh, this is a metadata study on the religion's effects, rates of theft, robbery, assault, murder, and drug use. The results show a decrease of about three to five percent in these rates over people in general. Uh, so are there studies that disagree? Arden did list some studies that show that there is a negative correlation to religion. That's true, there are, but the vast majority of studies are positive. This is a metadata study of 270 studies, 244 of which show a positive correlation to religion, two of which show a negative, and nine of which show nothing. The vast majority of the academic consensus is that religion does hold a majority positive impact. Does have a negative impact. There are some studies that show a negative impact, but the consensus is a positive impact by a significant margin. Does religion, to, to, to use an example, does religion kill or save more lives each year? Uh, homicides, uh, according to the UNODC, about 464,000 people are killed via homicides in 2017, whereas about 90,000 were killed in armed conflicts. So if we take the number of 7% of wars increased by religion, that's about 6,000 lives lost each year due to religion. And if we take the three to five percent of lives saved by religion and apply that to the homicide number, we get about 23,000 lives saved. So this religion addition to a society will save 23,000 lives and kill 6,000 lives. Overall, that's a net saving of 17,000 lives. Given this example uh, of just murder, religion clearly does more good than harm. And the same is true for drug use and selling, domestic violence, crime, suicide, and mental health, charity, depression, and prison inmate satisfaction, decreasing in violence, and lower recidivism rates. So all of these have about the same effect of about a 5% decrease, and across 100 billion people who are religion, this is a massive, massive positive influence that religion causes. Uh, this also causes a faster recovery rate from emotional and physical ailments. Uh, like holding a rabbit's foot, believing in the false hope of a magical being who cares about you can lower your stress level and cortisol level and release dopamine, allowing your immune system to function more effectively and your mental state to improve enough to move forward and heal faster. If you have a society who can heal faster from mental and physical anguish from going to the hospital, that will definitely be a benefit to the society than one who takes longer for the people to heal. Recovering from religious emotion, uh, there is, in a Cosmic Skeptic recent interview with Within Reason podcast, he mentions that the religious people who wear straps around the Bible to the, around their neck to prevent getting invaded lowers their stress level and helps them to move forward in life. And he also mentions another study where Israelis during the Lebanese Israeli war would pray daily, and those that did had a lower sense of terror and a lower stress level, and this effect was magnified the closer to the front of the war that it took place. This is an example of how religious belief can lower your stress level and help you to function and move forward in life in very difficult situations that is much harder to gain from a secular worldview. And so in difficult situations, having a religious ideology can help people to function and grow the economy and live and promote life much faster than a non-religious ideology in many cases. 
Uh, priming. Religion also provides an effective priming. Priming is when you tell someone about the Bible or moral things before they take a test or do some kind of work. And there's tons of studies that show when people are primed with moral um, primers, they do better. They don't cheat as much. They don't steal as much. They are more charitable. There's all kinds of studies on this. And so having a kind of religious belief like Jesus or whatever that causes you to think about moralizing things all the time, all throughout the day, will cause this priming effect to you far more often than someone who does not have some kind of a moralizing ideology that causes them to be primed throughout the day. So for each person, religion causes to be bad. It causes a thousand to do good. Millions have used the religion as inspiration to discover, and many have lost their faith because of it. Uh, many people who have been on the forefront of abolishing slavery, advocating for women's rights and workers' rights. So even though religion has caused uh, delays in these things, it has also caused many people to fight for these things. Many more people have fought for these things than have fought against them. If we remember correctly, the English, who were the first ones to abolish slavery, were Christians. And they used the Bible as a justification to end slavery. Um, the same thing applies to like Newton, who famously used his uh, idea of a god as a requirement to explain the orbits of the planet. He also used religion as an inspiration for him discovering things about the universe. He wrote more about religion than any other field. For every predator priest, there are thousands of priests who are good people just trying to help everyone around them. For every person who is indoctrinated and guilt-ridden and depressed and spends thousands of dollars of their excess money that they don't have to try to feel better, there are thousands more who are given hope and comfort and guidance and find meaning and value. And so I agree. Religion does do a lot of bad things, but it does a lot more good things. And so if, let's play Civilization V if you want to do that. You can add religion to your society. So there's 117 billion people, all of which get minus 5% crime, minus 5% drug rate, minus 5% suicide, plus 5 mental health, plus 5 primary to do good things, plus 5 criminal recidiv uh, lowering recidivism rate, a minus 5 domestic violence, plus 5 charity. The detriments of religion, the bad things, minus 1% of all of those things, which is 1%, it increases the amount of bad things people do by 1%, but decreases it by 5%, and it also increases wars by about 7%. Overall, the effects of religion is positive because the tons and tons of 100 billion people who are affected by minus 5 crime rates save significantly more lives than the increased lives lost from wars and atrocities, and the benefit to all of these aspects is many, many orders of magnitude greater than the detriment caused to the minority of people. As Ari mentioned, there is a very rarely do Christians do really bad things in churches, like eliminating all of the people who are there. That's just terrible. But the vast majority of them are good people just trying to do good things and build a community and help others. So I agree, religion does tons and tons of bad things, it does even more good things. So uh, even though I'm an atheist, I must follow the evidence wherever it leads, even if it leads to a conclusion that is uncomfortable. So religion has caused more good. Does religion cause an increase in violence and bigoted behavior? Yes, but it causes significantly more to do good. Does this mean we atheists are violent? No. Uh, the biggest challenge here is like if we had an atheist society like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they don't, they have lower rates of crime, lower rates of violence, and that's a valid point, but the benefit of religion is that in stressful situations, next to wars, next to poverty, uh, religion can help cope with those things and help you to move forward, which is much more difficult under a secular worldview. Secular worldviews are more challenging intellectually, more difficult to cope with, more difficult to find meaning. You have to really think about these things, and most people in difficult situations don't have the time and energy to do that. And so religion can provide a buffer for them emotionally to be able to cope that secular worldviews don't as much provide. Uh, so, to be a consistent skeptic, as because I acknowledge that there's value to religion, I think we atheists should create a religion to provide the same values, the same benefits to the demographics of society who, are, who this is useful for. It's not useful for everybody. Uh, as I and Aaron are both atheists, we don't really find these benefits. We were in the demographic that were on the negatively affected <coughs> side. But for many people that do provide these benefits, atheism should offer a kind of alternative to them, which is why I think we should start an atheist religion. Join the atheist church. I'll be the Pope of atheism. Thank you. And I'll conclude there. Thank you very much for that opening as well, Tom. We actually only have one mic. So for the open dialogue, I just need you guys to project your voice a little bit louder. Fortunately, it's a good, narrow pathway in terms of the venue. But with that, we're going to kick it over to you gentlemen. The floor is all yours. And Mike, or I'll grab that mic from you, Tom, to take it off your hands. Thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, we're ready for you. All right, so you're going to take both of the mics and have us yell. Yes, we must yell. Right. 
while he's holding two mics. Yes. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. All right, so uh, Tom's data contradicts the findings of the Clergy Project, which was started by Daniel Dennett. It was an organization for preachers who are professional preachers. They've been doing this for a while, and they realized that they no longer believe what they're selling to their congregations. And now, what do you do when you're 40 years old and you realize that you've been doing this all your life and you don't have any other skills, except maybe you could go out and become a used car salesman at this point? So they turn to this network, which is the Clergy Project, who for people to find solace and maybe employment or some kind of support Mike. elsewhere. <laughs> What's that? You can't hear. <coughs> James, James, we need the mic. Well, let me just rethink this. I'll do this a little better. I think <laughs> you can hear me this way. Okay. Tom's data <laughs> contradicts the findings of the Clergy Project, which found that preachers. Okay, thank you. Almost. I was starting to have fun with that. <laughs> like old timey church, right? Anyway, the, the, what these preachers have noticed, what, what, what the clergy project had noticed was that a trend in all of these preachers, preachers that gave up religion, they were lifelong believers, and when they gave up their religion, they found that they were less prejudiced. They were more tolerant, they were more liberal, they were, they were more forgiving and more curious. And so they would, they would often go back to school and learning science and things that, lamenting the things that they'd never learned before. In some of my videos, I've shown reports of a negative statistical correlation between religiosity and what we typically think of as moral behavior, where we notice that the factions of dominant religion statistically have the highest crime rate with special emphasis on hate crimes. Religious people have been shown to be more likely to condone the killing or torture of prisoners where non-religious people are, le are more likely to consider that morally wrong. But it gets worse, because the most religious countries also have the highest murder rate, and the same is true for the most religious areas of the United States. The higher the religiosity of a given populace, the higher the murder rate. Nations that are more secular show the opposite tendency, where the less religious they are, the more peaceful they tend to be. And here, and here in the United States, evangelical Christians have the highest divorce rate and the highest rates of teen pregnancy, and of abortions also, which isn't surprising in, in areas that teach abstinence only instead of offering sex education. And here in Texas, we've had consistently, when we were teaching abstinence only, we had to consistently had the highest rates of repeat teen pregnancies. Although I did read a newspaper article that actually said that teen pregnancies decline after they turn 20 when they're no longer teens. Yeah. But it gets worse still. Students in private religious schools where evolution is not taught are statistically more likely to get an abortion than their peers in public schools where evolution is taught. And this is a testament to the hypocrisy and shows what a colossal failure the policies of the religious right have always been. But it gets even worse than that. Child Protective Services and other agencies report that a significant majority of child abusers and molesters identify as very religious, and the more religious they are, the, more, the worse offenders they are with younger and more victims. And for some of us, all that matters is whatever is really true. Only accurate information has practical application, so we want to know what is true and not be fooled into believing things that are not true. So I agree that religion does cause harm, cause many people to do more harm. But the question is, is does it cause more people to do good? So what about what I presented? Do you disagree with that it causes more people to do good? Are there, are there more pastors out there who are actually helping people, who are trying to find homes, who are giving their time to comfort people, to give emotional support, especially in needs in hospitals, where they go and pray with someone and that lowers their stress level and helps them to cope better? Why would the fact that it causes some people to do harm negate the fact that it does the most people, more people to do good? You're assuming that, that religion most, you're just assuming you're religion that religion mostly does good, that most people are trying to help people by telling them comfortable lies. Yes. So I, I went to a children's hospital in Dallas, and I had a meeting with their, their what are they called? They're not chaplains. Yes, they're chaplains there. And they wanted to know from an atheist how to, how to help parents because they're having more and more atheist parents with children in their, the cancer wards. 
And they've said to me that one of the things that they would, they would say to believers, the things that would say to believers to make them more comfortable, you know, she's an angel now. God just needed another angel, and she's in a better place she's now. Just a little bit closer. All of that. And they said that what they noticed was that not only were these things not comforting to atheists, they said that it actually enraged them. I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that's no surprise. And they, they wanted to talk to me. And I had a room of like eight or ten of these chaplains asking me, well, how do we help atheist parents? Well, that's a great thing. And I'll, I'll concede to you, these chaplains want to help atheist parents, not just people in their own congregations. That's great. But I said, here's the challenge. The lies won't cut it. We, we, need to, we need to see your empathy. We need maybe, maybe a hug, maybe a tear, just, a, just something to acknowledge that you understand what we're going to, because there is no, no lie that will help us. I mean, I had a friend who's a genuinely good guy, who's a Southern Baptist preacher, who told me when my own daughter died in Children's Hospital of Cancer, my, not my daughter, my granddaughter, I'm sorry, when she died in Children's Hospital, when she had her second relapse leukemia, and we knew where that's going, he comes up to me, puts his hand on my shoulder very solemnly, and says, I'll pray for you. So I said to the guy, you know, imagine, imagine you've got a four-year-old girl comes up to you, and she realizes that you have a terrible problem you need to deal with. This four-year-old girl comes up to you and says she's going to write a letter to Santa to get you the help that you need. And you know she believes it. Does that give you comfort? No. no? no. Okay. Now imagine she's a 40-year-old fucking man. And she's telling you the same stupid shit. So that's, that's the problem. It's still a lie. It may be comfortable. It may be a white lie. It may people, and like this guy. This guy was a good guy, and he became a Christian because he thought that, that good equals God, and godliness is good, you know, whatever. So he's got this association going on. But it's not. He was a good guy anyway. If he was an atheist, he'd still be a good guy. His religion isn't causing him to do anything. He's just naturally inclined to do that. Well, just to jump in there, so if he did that to a Christian, would it make him feel better? If he did that to, yeah, apparently some people like being lied to. Yeah, so and lots of people are Christian, right? So if he goes up to, say, 100 people in a hospital, yeah. one of them is you, one of them, which obviously would hurt you, hurt me, because we are insulted by that, we are ex-religious, we don't think it's a valid ideology. But for the 90 other say, people... I don't want to say hurt or insulted, I mean, it's obviously but, irritating. The point is that the 90 other people he went to that day, he helped. He made them feel better. He made them feel comforted. He allowed them to emotionally cope with the situation and move forward in life. And so even if he did harm you in some way, which is not the right word, but the majority of the work he did that day was positive. He helped more people by a significant margin than the amount he hurt. Okay, so you're saying it's okay to tell white lies to people who like to be lied to. Yes. If like, they already believe in lies. What, what, have you, has your wife ever asked you if she looks fat in these jeans? <laughs> Would you like to plead the fifth? <laughs> we, we've had very interesting content, uh, conversations about that because I'm not going to lie. I'm just not. <laughs> and uh, not, But I, I will make sure that she understands, like, you are beautiful, dear. She knows I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's like a more difficult conversation, right? That takes a lot more effort. You have to think through it. You have to be very careful with your words. That's a difficult thing. And for people who have, have to work 20 hours a day, that's a more challenging thing to do than just say, nope, you do not look fat in those jeans, honey. Let's go to work. No, uh, aside from your example, I understand what you're saying. I'm not, I'm not even going to concede that. I will tell you, and I say this with some pride, I have never lied to my wife. We've been married for, we're going on our 14th year. I've never lied to her. It's cool. Appreciate it. But do you think that doing that does help many, many people cope in relationships? And many people who are not you and your wife do appreciate those kind of white lies. And it does help them emotionally and help them to move forward. I don't appreciate white lies. Well, you don't. But do yeah. most people. Do most people appreciate white okay. lies? Okay. If, if you're saying that it's okay to lie, to tell harmless white lies to most people because most people like to be lied to in our current situation, then I will agree, most people like to be lied to, and they don't see the harm in being lied to. Relatively few of us do, but we're a growing percentage. We represent like a third of the, of the populace globally now. It's a, a third of people, a third of the world population now, 
are un unassociated with any religion. They don't have any, any. They don't have any belief in faith. I myself identify as a Christianist. I think that, that faith is the most dishonest position it's possible to have. Just a note on that. I agree that a third of people in the world are no longer religious, but most of them are still spiritual. I think it's like 60% of atheists are still spiritual. But what does that mean? It means they like the white lies. Some of them do. My, my own journey out of that was, a, was I, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say that I didn't just wake up and say, hey, this is stupid, and just go to this more skeptical view. No, most of us had to do a, a, a walk, and I did mine through um, neo-pagan occultism. I wanted to do transcendental meditation. I thought that there was scientific evidence for uh, the paranormal. I want to experience that, leaving your body and doing things like this, that that was going to be the way of getting first-hand experience to know the truth of the matter. I tried that for years, even fooled myself through faith for a little bit to, to imagine things that weren't really there, which is what faith is doing. And I eventually came out of that. I wish that I could have just put down the book and said, this is stupid, and just be completely skeptical and logical, rational. But no, that's, that's a walk for most of us. Well, so I agree that you can get to the point where emotionally they don't help you and they can hurt you, white lies. But vast majority of people are benefited by them. It makes them feel better. There are neurological studies that show white lies make you feel better, it releases dopamine, it helps you to cope. And these effects of releasing dopamine, lowering cortisol, have massive effects on your body. It increases the rate of your immune system being able to function so you will get better from sickness faster. So yes, I agree that, or I think we should lie to people if it'll lower their cortisol level, if it'll help cure them of a disease faster. Yes, absolutely we should lie to them to help them function better in society. I don't care as much about the truth as I do about people's happiness and lives and well-being. And if lying can improve people's happiness, lives, and well-being, we should absolutely do it, yes. Yeah, I'm going to have to disagree with that. I, I, I'm just not going to lie to people. And, and I don't care if it makes them feel more comfortable. I'm going to find another way around that. And, and the, the, I love the, the way that you've made this debate where we can just as, using the same type of arguments, we could argue whether alcohol is the cause of or solution to all the world's problems. I don't quite follow. Never mind. You're, you're saying it's okay because most people enjoy it, right? So we well, say no, I'm saying it's okay because they enjoy it and it actually has demonstrably positive effects in society. We can say that about alcohol. Like what? That there, that there are positive benefits, that most people enjoy it, it does make people feel better, it, you know, it goes well with your food, the beer takes, makes the, the food taste better, sure. the food makes the beer taste better. A little bit, a glass of wine every day has some kind of positive benefit. I didn't bring studies for that debate, we're not gonna do that one today, but, but you've got a very similar thing going on here. Well, if alcohol helps you get better from being in the hospital, if it helps your mental health, if it helps you to have a lower recidivism rate when you got out of prison, if it helps you recover from cancer better, yeah, yeah, I'd be like, yes. If alcohol did all of those things, yes. Like, I, don't, I don't think alcohol does do any of those things. So I'm oh, not, I thought it did. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure how alcohol can help you like, cure your liver disease, but we can try it. Okay. So I don't, I, I don't know what, to, what else to say. I think we're, I think we're done with that. Well, do you agree that it helps more people in society than it hurts? Do I agree that most people, the majority of people, like to be lied to and sure. get enjoyment out of being lied to? Yeah, I, sure. I do. And do you agree that that has a significant effect on their mental and physical health? I don't know how it could, especially given that the, the type of misinformation that I quoted here and that, and that still plague people that are, that are believing in religion. You still have misinformation. You still have a degree of reality denial. You, you are still being completely convinced of things that are not true, or at least not evidently true. Well, why does that matter to helping people? Like, you don't need to know the truth to help there people. There it is. It's, oh, it always comes down. When I talk to believers, it always comes down to, why can't I believe it if it's not true? Why does it have to be true before I believe it? Well, no, my question is, why does it have to be true to help people? Because, like, there's a famous thing in evolution called type 1 and type 2 errors. Hear Russell in the bushes, think it's a lion, run away. Everybody runs away who survives. People who think, I'm going to be skeptical and wait for more evidence, attend, get eaten a little bit more. And so believing the fairy tale that there's a ghost or whatever in the bushes saves more lives, even though it's false. So I don't understand. Well, the the your, analogy isn't really the ghost in the bushes. What? It, yeah, it, what it really comes down to is that because we are social animals, we expect that uh, we, even when we're alone, that we think someone might be able to see us. So we're careful about what we're doing, what we're dressed, all like how we dress, all of that. But when you get into the, into the mindset of thinking that someone might be 
uh, watching you and might be reporting on you. Well, then you start acting like, well, they are. Somebody's always watching you. Somebody, and, and now they're not just seeing every movement that you make. They're also inside your head. This is how people are. They get, and they get, just get more and more paranoid. Well, it's now called a useful fiction, right? Because my point here was that things don't need to be true to help people. You can have useful fictions that help people, that save their lives by them thinking it's a ghost in the bushes and running away. The same thing can apply in this situation. It doesn't matter whether or not it's true or corresponds to reality. What matters is, is does having this belief help you to be healthier, recover faster, lower crime rates, whatever. Which contradicts the study that I was citing before. I mean, I, I can pull it up for you. Well, no, I agree. So I, I looked at the studies. The studies I listed are metadata studies of 200, 300, 800 different studies. So I agree there are some studies that go against the data in the single digits. So there's hundreds and hundreds of studies that show a positive correlation, a couple dozen that show a negative correlation, because that's how studies work. Okay. And so I, I, there are studies that go against this, but the vast majority go towards the fact that religion has a positive impact on society. At, the, at that moment, I was talking about the ones about prayer and how useless that is, and how it, how it doesn't even have the placebo effect. It actually makes things worse. Uh, well, that part I would disagree with, because I know there are some studies that show prayer doesn't have a placebo effect, but there's a lot that show it massively does. Like, specifically for people who are in cancer wards, when a priest goes up and prays with them, it reduces their uh, level of stress and helps them to recover faster. That was one of the studies I listed. So your argument is that it's okay to lie? Yes, I, 100%. Like, people like to be lied to. 100%. I don't, uh, there's nothing wrong with lying. I don't have a problem with lying. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to make a moral decision. Like, are there, are there Jews in the basement? Nazi comes up to your door and says, are there Jews in the basement? Is it okay to lie? My position on things like that, these types of moral dilemmas, is that lies and violence are in the same category, and both should be like last resorts, and maybe uh, inexcusable even in cases of self-defense. Maybe inexcusable. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by a last resort there. So, like, if this will cause Desperate people... situations. I mean, you, you resort to well, violence just to clarify. desperate situations. I got that self-defense. part. But okay. the question is, is where you define a desperate situation. If someone is in the hospital and you can recover, they can recover faster by like days, weeks, months, 5% or whatever, by telling them a lie, that seems to count as a desperate situation because if you apply that to millions of people who can all get faster 5% better and go back into the workforce and function in their lives, that's a huge benefit. If you can save 5% of lives, that's desperation. That seems like it's a completely justified reason to lie at this point. Okay. So, it's, so you're saying it's okay to lie because most people like to be lied to? Because it saves lives, yes. 5% faster, according to the number of studies. No, that's not saving lives. 5% of 100 is 5 lives saved. We were talking, you said 5% faster in their recovery. Right, so that so was one of the other is still happening. It's just somehow, yes. ha- it's just, they're, they're estimating that it's happening 5% later, the people who are faster, the people who believe the lies. So I also mentioned murder rates, it decreases by three to five percent. Um, and I also mentioned how we have all these reported studies about how these uh, the crime rates are, are higher and worse in the most religious areas. Because it's And the, and the child molesters are the, are the worst when they're the most religious. Those are also included in the studies. So as I mentioned, it does increase violence in some parts. And the reason murder rates are higher in more religious societies is because more religious societies also have more poverty. And more poverty causes more crime. So that's all accounted for in the studies I mentioned, which is why the vast majority of them show a positive correlation. And also in the cases of people who do the prayer, right? They're talking to some. They're talking to themselves, imagining that they're talking to somebody who can read their minds. And it doesn't matter who you're talking to. It doesn't matter if you're talking to Zenu telepathically and an alien somewhere. If you're talking to the, the ghosts of your ancestors, you can talk to a bloody handprint on a volleyball, and eventually they'll start talking back. This is a this is a mental condition that should be avoided. I think a mental condition is something that leads to negative side effects. If it leads to positive side effects, it's no longer a mental condition. Okay, you're, you're, you're reporting there are positive side effects, yes, and you're accepting that there are also negative side effects. And Absolutely, these are, these are lifelong. This Some is of just, them. They, no, they, these people have these misinformed beliefs. They are misguided their entire lives. So that's a problem. And I don't, they, and, and they also turn away from real medical help because of their religious belief. They deny medical help because they want, they want to be healed or because the religion forbids them from this or because... Some of them. Majority yes. of them don't. So I do agree there are people who are like anti-vaxxers, but that's the va- this vast minority of religious people. Like, as I mentioned before, there are lots of negative side effects of religion to a small percentage. 
But the positive side effects are far more. So I agree, it does cause some people to be anti-science, like young earth creationists. Most Christians aren't young earth creationists. So the fact that you keep listing these negative side effects, but you're not contrasting them to the positive side effects, the people who are benefited by these things. So I agree, if you always look at the bad things. You can't see it as a positive side effect when you have, okay, these people like to be lied to. That's not a positive side effect. Okay, they feel better because they've been lied to, because they like to be lied to. That's a problem that needs to be fixed. Well, if they live longer, and recover faster, and do more things because of that why, I see that as a benefit. Like, if I'm comparing two societies, they like to be lied to, but have less crime and less murder. I'm like, that's a better society. I don't care about the, the lying part. Who cares about that? I want this lives saved. There's a whole lot more to, if you want to argue the society, that there's a whole lot more to discuss that I'm not prepared to go into, because that's, I think, a different debate. Well, I don't think so, because it seems like if we adopt religion into a society, which is a group of people, and the effects on that society are mostly positive. You tell them all the same way. Are, are, well, any, any religion in this context? I'm not specifically picking one religion, but... Or are we, are we going to have different people believing different lives? Sure. And, and the different lives tell them that, that I'm better than you because you believe sure. something different. Yep, that's fine. So we're going to be judged by what we believe. Yes. Not what we do, what we believe. Sure. And that causes the positive impacts that I demonstrated in my slide. So even though it can cause an extra 7% of wars, an extra 11% of atrocities, it saves vastly more lives than it costs, even with the level of derision between religions. Okay, uh, I'm going to concede at least that most people, unfortunately, like to be lied to. Thank you, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're done. You got it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll actually start a Q&A line right in this aisle here. So anyone who has a question, if you can stand on this gray piece of tape, that way we can get you in the video feed. We'll welcome you, you up for the Q&A. Thank you. Core quote, the one where it said, ethical culture should qualify as a religion. Do you know who said that? Hugo Black. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, how's it going, guys? Um, do you think that the same contrast needs to be made about the amount of good religion provides in society right now versus the amount of hypothetical good it would potentially be made in the future had we gotten rid of it? In other words, would we be better or worse off without it? Did you hear that question? Yes. Uh, so he asked if we should contrast religion and the effects it had to today as opposed to if you replaced it early on and had a different ideology, what effects would that have? So I agree that religion is not the most effective ideology and there are other ideologies that are better. And so if we just went back in history, replaced religion with oh, secular humanism or something, it would have far less of the bad things and far more of the good things. So I agree with that completely. I don't think religion is the best ideology. But the debate, I'm, the position I'm advocating for isn't that religion is the best or that it's the thing that we should implement at all times. I'm only arguing that it has done more good than harm. So I, I'm in full agreement that there are better ideologies like secular humanism that would, don't entail a lot of the bad things and have more of the good things. Uh, this question is uh, for Tom. Um, you said in your opening statement that the number of uh, deaths attributable to religion was about 6,000. Do you really, uh, 6,000 per year, do you really think that number holds up to scrutiny when you consider stuff like the Islamic State butchered hundreds of thousands of people and that's just one organization? Yes, so like, uh, as I mentioned before, the number of wars and atrocities from the source I mentioned is an additional seven to 11%. So they cause an 11% more atrocities. So those numbers are actually included in that data for 2017, this is 2017. Um, and so yes, that, even including the Islamic State, the amount of murders increased on average is that number. I think what we'll do is, if you guys are okay with handing Mike. one of the mics off, and then we'll have one mic down here, that way the audience can hear the asker. All right. Thanks, I'll guys. Thanks for your flexibility. Hugs, hugs. If you can speak <laughs> into both of these. Oh, oh boy. Okay, so... I don't remember your name. You're the guy with the little shirt with the little pipe in it. Little the, shirt? Uh, Aaron. Okay. So my question basically is when it comes to lying in the sense of trying to make somebody feel better. 
So I'm going to use my own experience in this. So these past couple of years, I have struggled heavily when it comes to just sadness and depression. And early on this year, my mother passed away after you know, just a lot of failing health. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad or anything. So I just want to clear that up. But my question comes in, had I not, had I not had God, whether or not, you know, he's a lie or he's real, I probably would have killed myself. So I'm just curious as to what, what is your view when it comes to people like me, when it comes to people who have been saved from being tipped over the edge by religion? I don't, I don't have any way of relating to, and I don't want to speak to depression, mm -hmm. because I know that there's different causes for that, and I don't have any personal experience or, or expertise in it at all. But I, I can't understand, or, or I can't really accept that you would have killed yourself if you didn't believe this lie. I, I, just, don't, I just don't see that. I think people find a reason to keep going, and you just, if that was the one you found, if that's the one you're blaming for. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good answer, actually, so. I, Do you mind if I comment on that a little bit? Oh, yeah, no problem. So, I also had major depression, and I tried all the different things to try to make me feel better. And for me, it was um, physical relationships with very attractive people would help me feel better. Can you, see? there you go. So, um, and so the, the things that can cure people for depression are very, 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 Diverse. Everyone's unique. Everyone's a different person, and so what can help them is distinct to the individual. And so I fully acknowledge the fact that religion helps many people to get over depression. David Wood, who I don't know if he's here in the audience today, was helped by religion to become a more moral person. This happens all the time, and so I think that it's a weakness of our position that he can't acknowledge that um, because it is absolutely the case that religion can help people and inspire them in ways that can definitely save their lives. And so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your position, and I hope that you're feeling better. Uh, I appreciate both of you answering. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's right. Okay. So um, I was. I thought your speech was really funny and awesome, and I came to realize that absolutely, you know, yes, Satanism or your religion is a religion according to your definition, which. I think is what you're arguing. And I was wondering, according to that religion of yours, how have you personally seen it affect your family and the people in your life in a positive way um, for, for you? I chose the Satanic Temple because I wanted to support their defense of the First Amendment. To fight fire with the fire, fire, I'm using religion to fight against religion in order to preserve secularism, which is the only way to preserve freedom of religion. The greatest threat to religious freedom is religious extremism. It is the, the religious nationalism. It's the, the, I've been an activist for almost 20 years, and the enemy in, uh, on every issue, every attack against truth, against education, against the Constitution, has always only ever come from religious conservatives. They're on the wrong side of every issue. And so I belong to an organization that promotes or that defends the First Amendment. And that's the way I view that. It doesn't change anything about my family. We already dress like we were in the Adams family. <laughs> so, so basically, um, if I hear you right, that, you, um, that your religion has helped you fight other religions more Where's effectively. That, your your religion of joining the Satan, your fight, your fight against religion, which is your religion, has helped you better fight other religions. Again, I don't. As I said, it doesn't fit my definition of a religion. Okay. I mean, it, I paid twenty five dollars for a membership to an activist organization. Sure. That's how I see it. Okay. And I I paid similarly for an ordination ordination to this religion, and they don't believe in this guy either. Okay. Awesome, thank you. And then we'll also have question askers move up to this first gray line. Actually, do you mind if I comment on that really quick? So I think your question was, what are the positive benefits of secular religions like Satanism? And Satanism has lots of positive benefits. They do lots of charity work. They do lots of help. There's uh, the Universal Unitarians provide housing. The church I'm starting provides housing. Secular organizations do tons to help people 
um, and essentially the same things any regular churches do. So secular organizations, secular churches do just as much, if not more good, to help religious to help people as religious organizations as Aaron mentioned in his opening. Yeah. Now I do not argue that there, there, there's a downside to uh, the community that you get from religions that might be said these secular organizations. But the secular organizations, as I said, you know, they don't have a faith-based requirement. They don't have required beliefs and prohibited beliefs, and they're not a belief system. Then they're not a religion. It's the doctrine that makes it the It's the faith that makes it a religion. If the faith is also the problem, because it means that you are being completely unreasonable about your position. Well, sorry, I, I agree that's a important. Yeah, I agree that's an important aspect to religion, and I base my religion off my belief in objective morality, so I, I agree with your definition there. I don't see it as a problem. I don't think faith is, faith is an issue. I think believing what makes you happy is more important than believing what's true about reality, and you should only focus on reality if that's what's important to you. Okay. Yes. Uh, both of you can address my... Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, first of all, I am surprised to hear from an atheist kind of support for uh, some positive notes on religion. Now, I would like to touch a little bit on religious extremism. It's like the forward, actually. Sorry about that. Right on. There you go. Uh, I would like to you both to touch a little bit on religious extremism. There is no Baptist terrorist organization. There is no Methodist terrorist organization. But we do have the same in other ones. Would you like to touch both of you can? Well, we do. Have Baptist terrorist organizations. Can you name one? Um, I, the names escape me right now, uh, but there are, there are, I, I think, in time, and I have a moment on the internet, I can show you that uh, most of the terrorist activities have been identified as such by the definition uh, have actually been done in the United States in the last 10 or 20 years. They've, they've been by right wing Christian organizations, yeah. particularly Christian nationalists. I can think one name comes to mind, the Christian Identity, which was the organization that was, uh, that they were the ones that, that blew up the Murrah building in Oklahoma City in the 1990s. So that they're one. Uh, and then I wish I could remember the other, the other names of the, the more recent groups, but there are a few of them. And there was another one that uh, took over a bird sanctuary in, I, I forget what state that was, but yeah, there was, and some people died over that, and, and there's, there are others where they've been holding armed conflicts with police and federal officers. So yeah, they, they do happen, we do have them. They just, you, you tend not, in the American news, they tend not to identify white Christians as terrorists, regardless whether they fit the definition or not. So you name two? So there are terrorist organizations in pretty much every religion other than Jainism. Jainism is the only one I know that doesn't have that. Even like Shinto Buddhism, which is the second most pacifistic religion on the planet, has terrorist organizations in it. And so there is a small minority of people who can become extremists in pretty much any religion, even the most pacifistic ones. There's only one exception I know about, which is Jainism, and that's it. And Sikhism is also very, very pacifistic. Um, but what is it, did you have a specific question about the extremist organizations? Like, because most, most people in those religions are extreme pacifists, so there's extremists on both ends. My question, uh, my point was, we see one particular religion that is really doing the extremism. We don't see, I don't see any Christian organization or any Christian religion with any kind of religious affinity. I don't see that. Oh, well, they, moral progress in our society has pushed most people in Western progress societies to become more moral. But back in the day, uh, there were crusades, witch hunts, uh, mass murders, genocides, all kinds of things done by Christians. Luckily, most Western society where Christians are predominant have progressed past that, but it was, they, they were the most terroristic in the world at one point. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to take more time on leaving to others. Thank you. One is for the stream and one is for the speakers. Yes, hi, my question's for T-Jump. So it seemed that you were hinting at um, the Nordic countries, like much less religious than I think our country here. Um, lower crime, more peaceful overall, better health outcomes in our, our healthcare situation here. Um, when you had your slide about with the civilization game, it was like four or something like that. Um, 
why wouldn't you run that as everyone's the Nordic countries, not there's religion? That goes back to the original question. So my argument here is that religion is the best ideology. There are other better ideologies, and secularism, once you get rid of all the poverty and war and stuff, is significantly better at everything. But the argument is that religion has done more good than harm overall, not that religion has done the best. So if I had a choice of any ideology, obviously I'd pick my own, because mine's probably the best one ever in the world. But uh, I'm not arguing that we should implement religion above all other options. My argument is only that religion has caused more good than harm overall. Thank you for there's, there's another issue about you know, just declaring the Nordic countries because it's not true of all the Nordic countries and it isn't just exclusively Nord, Nordic countries. I mean, Japan, Taiwan, they're, they're both kind of in there too. Have you stand right here. Oh. Right here, right as I'm standing. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Yeah. Hi there. Um, this, this is mainly for T-Jump, but one thing, I've been mean, seeing there thinking of how to word this, <laughs> so excuse me. Um, but one thing that the studies I feel didn't address is the long-term effects. Like if someone is given a bunch of white lies about religion, if later on they come out of religion through some means, they have um, rough relationships with people who told them their white lies. And I think, I mean, that would be hard to do a study on, but I think that should be a factor. And I'm surprised you didn't bring that up, Aaron, because I think that's a, very devastating effect and why organizations like Recovering from Religion Foundation exist is due to those. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Oh yeah, absolutely. There are many cultures where leaving the religion can get you ostracized by your entire community, you lose your job, lose your family. But again, that's the minority. That's like Bible Belt sections of religion mostly. Most, like I think a large percentage of Christians in this nation are not like that. It's a minority thing, you hear about it in the news, but most today are not like that. The vast majority are kind of pretty accepting, like my parents are mostly accepting, um, and most people who leave the faith, like in college, their parents don't disown them. They keep talking, they continue to be families, and so uh, a feature of the news is that we focus on the hyper-negative aspects, and we don't put that into contrast with the total aspects, and so I agree that that is a problem and a negative aspect, but it's the same with the other data I presented. It's like a negative 1%, but like a plus 4% on the people who are accepting. And so overall, it has more of a positive acceptance rate than a negative acceptance rate. Hello. Um, my question is, if you believe it does more harm than good, that without religion, morality tends to become relative and not as predictable and fixed, uh, no. So uh, there's a few surveys, no, there's a survey done on professional philosophers. 72% uh, of professional philosophers are atheists. No God. Then they take the hard position, God does not exist. Uh, but 65% believe in objective morality. So it's a belief among public, of the public, that you can't have objective morality without God, but that's totally false. There are tons of objective moralities about God. Like there are religious traditions like Buddhism where you have like a field, a karmic field. You don't need, a, you don't need morality without a God. That's pretty much a symptom of the fact that in our culture, we're told that God is the only possible basis of objective morality, but it's just false. Like you can, there are lots of models of objective morality without God. I have one, uh, and so you don't, it's just not to. You agree with him? Yeah. I, I have the, the weird position. Uh, for, first, I want to say that, oh, where is it? Uh, <laughs> just make you hold the mic, do all the work. All right. Uh, first, I want to say that Aaron's, your, your hair is fantastic. And also, that someone left their, uh, I don't know if it's a hotel card or something, but if someone want to look for it, it's probably yours. Gotcha. You got it? Um, can you hear it? All right. Uh, my question is so, um, there are people that, uh, so uh, on Tom's case, uh, some people are having benefits in, uh, in religion, and uh, but both claim that it is false. The thing is that uh, it, it is a personal experience. So when it comes to uh, direct acquaintance with the uh, facts of reality, which is the basis for uh, how we know things uh, epistemologically, uh, can you guys tell us like how do you guys know um, that what they uh, that they are not experiencing uh, something that is true because they are the ones experiencing it. So if they got direct acquaintance with those experiences. Uh, they are the ones that are acquainted and you guys wouldn't be acquainted with that. So, 
just want to know how do you guys actually uh, psychologize the uh, the other people that claim to have those experiences? Sure. So I'm also an atheist, so I'm a hard atheist. I believe God does not exist because all the evidence goes against him. So it's kind of off the topic of the debate, but I would say that if you have no way to differentiate imagination from reality, all of the evidence points to is probably imaginary because we have human brains who make up a lot of imaginary things. And so your personal experience in law, in history, is not sufficient evidence to justify anything that lacks an empirical basis. So if you bring like miracles, magic, mythical creatures, paranormal, supernatural, UFOs in the courtroom, it gets thrown out. So personal experience does not count as evidence for anything that lacks uh, an empirical basis. The, the thing is, you said justification, yeah. and when it comes to, in, in uh, classical foundationalism, direct acquaintance is already justified because it's, it is something that you're experiencing in reality, and the, uh, how it relates is that, uh, so you're saying it is... Uh, well, just to jump in there, that's why we don't use that in courtrooms or history or most of science, because that fundamental epistemology just doesn't work when it comes to accurately assessing the vulnerabilities of personal intuition and personal experience, which is why we don't use them in the hard sciences. Yeah, but can you provide a, uh, an abductive case of uh, why it doesn't, doesn't work? Yeah, intuition fails the vast majority of the time when trying to assess reality. It's a failed methodology, which is why science rules it out. And so when you're trying to make up what does work, what gives us justification, that's a really good reason to think intuition is probably wrong whenever you're using it. Uh, but we're talking about agents, so for example, if you, uh, agents are very unpredictable, and uh, so it is odd to try to find predictability when if it's another agent, uh, I mean, it's not like we can predict everything that an agent can do, can do because we're talking about uh, miracles here. So uh, don't you think it's the wrong methodology? Uh, no, if the agent is equally as predictable as random chance, then the difference between that agent doing it and it happening by random chance is zero. So there's no difference between the agent and nothing. Uh, I, did, I did say random chance, but we're talking about like just uh, millions and millions of things happening. So it's, a, it's just a very, well, just, just very a complex bit, so uh, way of uh, actually uh, uh, getting into truth with that, so I'm just, it can just be it's just so complicated that it is very hard for you to actually do a, a, uh, a an experiment where, where it's a, 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 a consistent natural on that. So it's just very hard to find that consistency, is what I'm saying. All of the data shows there's no difference between a god or conscious agent doing and random chance and nothing existing doing it. So what's the difference between a god who does nothing and something that doesn't exist? There isn't one. So that's why science does not accept any of this personal experience stuff. It's terrible evidence. We've proven it's terrible. We know psychologically it's terrible. It is a not a good reason to believe something is true. You said it. Okay, yeah, so uh, for example, the, the last question I can give you, and then we've got to go Yeah, no, I, all right, that's fine. Thank you, guys. Aaron, your hair is great, again. Hi, uh, this is for Tom for uh, clarity on some of your arguments. Um, when you were citing the studies, uh, research on religious practices for the Paris capitalism and such to regulate the nervous system, was the belief in the supernatural a proven factor, or were other things such as physical awareness, uh, mental focus, community, and just belief Yes, all of those were controls in the study. So the study was specifically done contrasting a control group of non-religious non-believers and a belief of believers and praying and those kinds of experiences and beliefs in the supernatural. Awesome, thank you. We'll take just a minute in case there are any last questions. Otherwise, awesome, great. If you can stand right in front of the gray line there. So basically, I understand what both of you are saying. So um, my whole uh, my whole thing, what I'm what I'm thinking is um, as a yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I was thinking that you know, in the short term, right, as um, religion might do more good than harm. Um, I'm thinking that in the long term, right, you're spreading uh, you're spreading like logic that you know you're having more people fall into weaker arguments and you're spreading that and in the long run I think that you're not really um, like how do I say it you're not um, you're you're not like worsening or you're not bettering the issue but you're still keeping that um, would there be is there a way to like utilize that that would effectively in the long run um, reduce uh, you know bigotry 
um, and you know, uh, atrocities like via religion, using that, that makes sense. Yes, that is why I'm starting an atheist religion based on my morality, to try to do exactly that. So yes, I think that as atheists, we should provide a kind of religion that helps people who are uh, benefited by those kinds of beliefs to move in a more moral direction instead of letting the less moral religions take over and influence their beliefs. Why would you start an atheist religion? I already belong to four of them. Mine's better. Mine is the true religion. Mine, mine is the one true religion. <laughs> Thanks so much. Let's give our speakers one last round of applause.